Today's episode is sponsored by Surfshark. Go to surfshark.deal slash Dominic Noble and use the code Dominic Noble to get 85% off a two-year plan and three extra months free. We'll talk more about the many reasons to use a VPN later. Hello, my beautiful watchers. Don't worry, we will get to that trailer. Let's just have a bit of fun talking about the book first, okay? Artemis Fowl was the first of what would become a series of eight books and multiple spin-offs, published in 2001 and written by Irish author Owen Colfer. I doubt I pronounced that right, although wouldn't it be really funny if an author notorious for always having his name mispronounced was the first one I didn't garble? As you can probably tell from the title of the video, I am a relative latecomer to this series. These books are intended for quite a young audience and hold a very nostalgic place in many people's hearts. I'm going to pitch the basic setup of the world and the story for newcomers and those in need of a refresher, uh, I will endeavour to make it as relatively spoiler free as possible, but obviously it will inevitably be more spoilery than just going in blind and reading the books for yourself, so be warned. So, in this early 2000s world of Colfers, fairies exist, but they've been slowly dwindling over the millennia as humans took over more and more of the planet. Not the most original of concepts so far, but bear with me. More uniquely, in this case most of the fairies now live in a huge subterranean city down near the Earth's core, like in the Matrix, except humans are the killer robots. Their technology does appear to be superior to humans, not by like thousands of years, but they do have a lot of cool tech that we sure as hell don't have yet. Incidentally, when I say fairies, I'm using it in the same way the book does, i.e. as a general term for all fairy tale creatures, you know, elves, dwarfs, goblins, trolls, all the good stuff. Anyway, enter Artemis Fowl. The Fowl family is a very old and formerly very, very rich Irish crime organisation. After about a century of prosperity, the family had fallen on hard times very recently when the current head of the family, Artemis Fowl the I, attempted to muscle in on the Russian Mafia's territory and appeared to have gotten himself and a ship full of the family's resources blown up. Either from grief or some other medical reason, his wife had slowly lost her mind and become a recluse living in the attic, hallucinating about her lost love, which left only their 12-year-old son, Artemis Fowl II, to run the estate and try to restore the family's power. Fortunately, it turns out Artemis the Younger is a criminal mastermind and uber genius. Before the story has even begun, the lad has figured out that the faith folk exist, and within two chapters he's managed to get his hands on more insider information about their ways than any other human in history. Amongst other things, he learns that due to cultural significance to them, they have accumulated massive stockpiles of the world's precious metals, especially gold, and sees this as a way of restoring his family's lost wealth and getting back into the crime game. Not a boy for big operations, apparently, his entire team consists of one manservant slash bodyguard Mr. Butler, who, to be fair, is usually more than enough for most situations because he's massive and a martial arts master, and Butler's teenage sister, Juliet, who works around the house as a maid and helps take care of his sick mother. Artemis devises a cunning plan to kidnap a fairy and hold them hostage until their government agrees to pay him a literal ton of gold. By chance, his victim is an elf girl named Holly Short, who is the first female captain in the reconnaissance division of the Lower Elements Police, or Leprechaun for short. Holly had not performed the ritual that charges up her magic powers in quite a long time because she was running herself ragged trying to keep up with her superiors' expectations of her. Commander Root, who is basically a grumpy police chief archetype, has been holding her to a super high standard because he knows that if she slips up even a little, the apparently quite sexist fairy society will use that as an excuse to stop women from advancing to the higher ranks in the future. Artemis figures out where she's going to be and uses her temporary vulnerability to tranquilize her and take her prisoner in his ancestral home in Ireland. The main meat of the episode is a high-stakes game of cat and mouse between Artemis and the fairy government as they attempt to rescue their operative, with some political power struggles within the LEP and Holly's escape attempts mixed in for extra spice. So, the first thing that you should notice here is that Artemis is indisputably the bad guy. I think that's very important to explaining why these books are so special. There are very few authors who would trust in a young audience to understand the nuance of a protagonist who is clearly in the wrong. Artemis is no Robin Hood. He's not taking from obviously evil people and giving it away. He kidnapped someone who had done him no harm and used threats against her life to take what didn't belong to him. And not because he was destitute, he was living in a fucking multi-million euro mansion. He wanted it because it stung his pride that his family wasn't as filthy rich and powerful as they used to be. There's a moment near the end where Artemis gets some humiliating comeuppance and is thoroughly humbled, and there was no real doubt that he deserved it. But all that said, the story lets you know that it is still okay to root for him, because while he is the bad guy, he's not a bad person. He's complicated. He's genuinely conflicted on his actions, he's never cruel for the sake of it or enjoys seeing people suffer, he cares a great deal for the people around him, and 
well, there's quite a few other things, but I can't say for big spoiler reasons, but the lad has some good in him, trust me. Minor spoiler, which I don't mind revealing because you'd know it if you glance at the back of any of the later books, not shockingly, in the future he and Holly are forced to team up multiple times, either because their goals aligned or against some greater evil. It's the best kind of redemption arc, the type that isn't afraid to firmly establish that this motherfucker needs some serious redeeming while simultaneously avoiding making us hate him. I just... I appreciate the respect that Colfer showed his readers by allowing his protagonist to be an antagonist for his entire debut book. Fortunately, the less morally ambiguous protagonist Holly and the late joining third main character Maltz the kleptomaniac dwarf are also interesting people to get to know, so no matter what part of the book you're reading, you won't be bored. Okay. Attempts to get an Artemis Fowl movie adaptation in the works apparently date back quite a way, so you can imagine how excited fans were when they discovered that Disney had finally greenlit the project to be directed by Kenneth Branagh. Originally planned for cinema release, the COVID-19 pandemic has inclined Disney to instead premiere the movie on their streaming service, Disney Plus, on June 12th, 2020. However, as soon as the first trailer dropped, fan reactions ranged from bad to utterly heartbroken. If you've not seen it, there's the thing, go and watch it now and keep everything I just described about the plot and the characters in mind. I will wait here and, I don't know, polish my sword for a bit while I wait for you to get back. It wasn't an innuendo. Right. What the f- fuck was that? I don't want to go over everything that seems utterly, utterly messed up in that trailer because one, I don't have all day, two, as horrifying as it looks, it is still just a trailer. There is a chance that some of it might be super misleading, and three, I am planning to rush out a review of the movie when it comes out next month, so I need to save some stuff for that. However, some highlights. This does appear to be an adaptation of the first book. I say this partly because Colfer confirmed it, and partly because there's some small but recognisable elements, like Artemis decoding the fairy book, Malt sticking his fingers up the goblin's nose, and the troll getting unleashed. Of course, those are the only things that I can see that are recognisably loyal to the book. More worryingly, Artemis seems like a sweet, innocent lad who has no idea that his father was a criminal or that the fairy world exists. I couldn't see any evidence of a kidnapping plot, so, you know, the entire plot of the book, the first shot they use to establish Holly is her shaking hands with Artemis and declaring their friendship. Holly Short's initial arc is trying to make it as the first female high-ranking LEP officer, but Dame Judi Dench is playing a gender-flipped Commander Root, so she's not. And both Artemis Fowl the First and Opal Kabai, two characters who do not feature in the relevant book, appear to play large roles in the story. Referring back to Colfer's video, which by the way I highly recommend people watch because the last three questions in his Q&A are very revealing. Anyway, from what I can deduce, it seems like Sir Kenneth Brannan got it into his head that film Artemis is going to need to be accessible before he can be a cold calculating criminal. Due to this, I'm guessing this film is going to sequel bait with him turning to the dark side right at the end after being quite nice for most of the runtime. If that's true, it just seems unnecessarily complicated to me. In order to make the redemption hold the same weight, they'll have to do another story right after this one of him being an ass for an entire film and then get back to his original arc. I also highly disagree with Brannon's assumption that Artemis needs to be good before he can be bad for him to be likeable. Do you know why? Because that's the books! 25 million copies sold! It worked! Isn't that one of the biggest advantages of an adaptation, you know the story will be popular because it already is. It's tried and tested already. Sorry, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. I need to go and have a stiff drink and wait for the film before I fully lose my mind over it. To be continued. If you'll bear with me just a moment longer, my beautiful watchers, I think many of you will want to hear about the advantages of today's sponsor. If you, like me, are just straight up done with geoblocking and all the ridiculous rules about what programs are available where, then listen up, this one's for you. I mean, you must have experienced it by now. Distribution rights lead to one program being available on British Netflix but not American, another being available on Disney Plus only in America, or is out there months and months before anywhere else. It's annoying, unfair, but thankfully no longer an issue with the use of a VPN like Surfshark. Just fire Surfshark up, choose a server from around the world to connect to, and instantly gain access to all the hitherto denied to you wealth of programming. I personally just enjoyed watching Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them on Australian Netflix after discovering it was unavailable to me on the American version. Another indispensable use of this service is the security it can provide you. Surfshark protects your information from the myriad of poor intention people and companies who wish to steal your information for profit. You see, it filters all of your internet use through a specific 
perfectly configured remote server that hides your IP address and encrypts all of the data you send and receive, making it impossible for someone to collect and log. Surfshark even offers a multi-hop function, passing your connection through multiple countries for an extra layer of safety. In addition to being one of the fairest price VPNs, Surfshark is also offering my viewers an additional 85% off a two-year plan and three months extra for free. This special offer makes your subscription just $1.77 per month, so if you would like to join me in safety and sweet, sweet freedom from geoblocking, follow the link in the video description or go to surfshark.deals slash Dominic Noble and use the code Dominic Noble. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Let's strike a deal, shall we? I'll try to never raise your blood pressure as much as the Artemis Fowl trailer and you throw me some likes, comments and shares to stop my channel from being smashed by the algorithm. Please take care of yourselves out there and I will see you soon. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz and Sam Cucinotta. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That that's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the dorm, I can't do that, for I have no money left after building a personal fortress to prepare for the coming zombie apocalypse. Do you have any idea how expensive a lifetime supply of food, water and ammunition is? Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickaroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day and I will see you in the next episode. And both Artemis Fowl the First and Opal Co Oh, I don't know how to say that name. To be directed by Kenneth Bran 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 Branigan. Branig Bran 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 Butler's teenage sister, Dude, 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 Juliet. Juliet. Meet you at dawn for a Juliet.